All right, let's talk about annelids. So this is a phyla of invertebrates. They can be found within the fossil record dating about 530 million years ago. So we've had them around for a long time. Scientists really believe, or think at least, that they evolved from the sea and two-thirds of today's annelid species um, were once alive back in prehistoric time. So they really haven't had to change. Most annelid species now are terrestrial species, um, such as terrestrial earthworms, which means they live on land. In addition, most of them are segmented and they are coelomates, which means they have a highly specialized organ system. Again, an endoderm, an exoderm, and a mesoderm. Most annelids have these external brussels called setae. They allow for a few things to happen. One, they're um, sensory organs, so they can show a degree of specialization um, to see what's going on within the environment around them. And they're also able to uh, move the organism through the environment. So not only are they sensory, but motion organs for the setae. Most annelids have a large fluid-filled coelom. Um, this would be what we consider our mesoderm. And then they have organ systems, which are highly specialized, including a closed cardiovascular system. Nice, right? Heart, arteries, capillaries, and veins. And then they have a specialized excretory system to remove. So they have both a mouth and an anus. So let's look at the segmentation here. And so we have a picture of a common earthworm sitting here. Annelids are made up of these repeating segments. You can see each of the segments as we go along. They're circular in motion. However, these repeating segments um, are really important because they allow for flexibility. They have a head and tail region. The head has a mouth. The tail has an anus for that. And they also have internal body walls, um, a septa, which these are segments the most annelids have. Each segment has its own fluid-filled cavity we know as a coelom. And you'll see that we have a mouth and esophagus, um, a fornix, a crop, a gizzard. Notice crop and gizzard are found also in birds, which then connect to an intestinal tract. You can see these darker bands that are running along the sides here. Those are part of the cardiovascular system. So it has places for nutrients to pass through each segment. It has a circulatory system that's moving that. Again, see how we're moving that material all the way through each of the segments. The segmentation allows for the freedom for it to move. It's able to contract and relax each one of those segments independently, allowing for complex body movements. Annelids do have a nervous system. They have a cerebral ganglia. A ganglia is a primitive brain or a cluster of nerves that's found near the head region. Um, it's connected to a nerve core, which runs on the outs underside of the worm, so it actually can sense the environment it's in. Um, it has sensory information to tell if there's too much water within the soil. It'll actually surface or go to the top um, so they don't drown. They're able to transport information from each of those little segments back to the ganglia and interpret that information. They're able to reproduce sexually. Again, you're higher on the evolutionary totem pole if you can reproduce sexually versus asexually. Both mollusks and annelids have a trochopore lava, or sorry, larvae um, formed and it emerges from a fertilized egg and then that develops into an adult or the adult form of that. So they do have an embryonic state, a juvenile state, and an adult state. So let's talk about the diversity of annelids. So there's about three major groups that we talk about, marine worms, earthworms, and leeches. It's based on the number of city or bristles that they have. Um, the absence or presence of a parapoda and if which of the uh, flap shaped appendages it uses for gas exchange and locomotion. So let's talk about marine worms. Um, I think they're kind of weird looking. Marine worms have segments as we can see each one of these have a pair of feet off of the segment. 
Most of them live in ocean habitats or salt water. They are often um, iridescent in colors, as we can kind of see with this one, almost translucent, but yet darker. They have these paddle-like parapoda, parapoda meaning pairs of feet um, on most of the segments. And the parapoda will actually allow them to swim. They can burrow through sand or crawl on surfaces. And you'll notice with these worms, or marine worms, that we have sensory organs coming off of the head and tail. These are important so that they can sense the chemical disruptions in the environment and also predators that are coming along with them. So it's very important for them to see that. This is a tube worm. This is another example of a marine worm. They have a well-developed eye. We actually have freshwater um, tube worms as well. You can find those within Moccasin Creek. So if you would grab a bucket of water, you can actually see tubes start to form. These guys will build these tubes and then their heads will stick out of the tube and they actually will gather their nutrients and food that way. They secrete the substance that forms this tube um, for marine ones, these especially, and then they'll pop up when they're scared, they actually retreat down into the tube. Here we go with earthworms. Earthworms are pretty common to this area. I think we're very familiar with the earthworm. And so they are typically found in freshwater. Um, these guys have no parapoda or pairs of feet. They have fusitae on each segment. And if you feel them, they'll have one side that's smooth and you can feel the segmentation, but the other side is a little bristly. Um, and that's those bristles. But there's not very many of them. Uh, they lack a distinct head or tail region. So you can't really tell the head from the tail. They have no eyes because they are not, um, they live underground. So they do not have a light sensitivity um, and they have a sen they are very sensitive, sorry, they're very sensitive to light and they have touch sensitivity. So if you ever touch an earthworm, it like shrinks back up or shrivels back up and all the um, segments contract at one time but they don't have an eye segment because they are typically live in the ground. They are extremely important for decomposers, for the environment they produce. They break up dead and decaying material into fresh soil. So they're really actually very important. They also help to aerate the soil. So if you don't have earthworms within your garden or things like that, you might not have a, as productive of a garden. So they're really important. They actually poop out what we consider soil. So if you, when we do that dissection of them, you'll see this black material within their intestinal tract towards their anus, and it is soil. Okay, so dirt is poop. So when we start looking at our earthworm, uh, they are scavengers. Again, we said they break down material, they ingest soil, they store it in what we consider our crop here. So they do have a mouth. The materials that they eat will go through the farnex, it will go to the crop and then to the gizzard, and that is broken down within those two. Gizzards and crops are also found within our bird species. And then it will pass through the intestinal tract. You'll notice that we have our veins, our vessels here, these little red guys all over here, are supplying nutrients to the body, um, and it will drain back to what we consider the heart of the body here. We have our nerve cord on the bottom side, as you can see here, and the ganglia on the top side. The nerve cord will run down the dorsal side all the way to the anus, from the mouth all the way to the anus. We can see that it has a true coelom here, or segments, where it's actually divided out into the different compartments. It will go through um, an intestine, and we can break down these. So there's a lot of things that are very similar um, that we have that we also see within these earthworms. And so it is important that we know that they're able to absorb nutrients from their digestive tract into their bloodstream and pass that into each one of their cells. Everything that is not used for food, so it's waste product, it is removed through the anus and, a, and they are called castings. Then we have leeches. Leeches live in calm bodies of fresh water, like Moccasin Creek. And they usually will live among the vegetation. 
leeches are looking for a food source. They have a mouth end that is very distinct. Um, however, they lack city and they do not have parapoda or pairs of feet. They will flatten themselves and they will then stick to a subject. The one thing that's really cool about leeches, as we can see here, the circular mouth will release a numbing fluid. That numbing means that you can't actually feel the leech start to suck onto you, and then it releases an anticoagulant. That anticoagulant prevents your blood from clotting so that it can fill up as big as it wants to uh, gain as much blood as it needs, and then you can remove it. Leeching is actually a medical practice that is still practiced today. Um, where if somebody would have a limb removed, they would then put leeches onto that attached or reattached limb so that it would put blood supply through that. So if you would get your finger cut off and they would reattach that finger, they might put leeches on that reattached portion to force blood down through that reattached portion. Or if you would have plastic surgery and you had your nose redone, they, if there's a poor blood supply, they might actually put leeches on your nose to suck blood through there. Um, those leeches have gone through a sterilization process where they're not feeding on random things so they won't pass any parasites onto you. In the olden days, they used to do leeching to actually just remove your blood because they thought the reason you were sick was because you just had a batch of bad blood. Not the case, by the way. And so leeches are really cool for that portion of it. Um, a lot, some of them are scavengers, but most of them are parasitic. Leeches do not want to necessarily kill their hosts, but leeches will feed on their hosts until they are no longer needed to feed on that host, and then they'll release. They can ingest almost 10 times their weight in blood, which is a little on the disgusting side when you think about that. And when you have a leech attached to you and it's really full of blood, do you really want to squeeze that? Just think what's going to happen. Vomit. Regurgitation. <laughs> anyway, these leeches can be used for medical purposes. We also have removed their anticoagulants and their numbing solution. And then we actually have replicated them synthetically to help with things such as heart disease, um, headaches, and so there are some uh, actual really great uses for leeches in the medical field, and we still use them today.